Kia ora. It looks like everybody wants to start because you're looking with intense uh, views to, to us, no? So let's, uh, we're ready to start as well. Um, kia ora te whanau, um, haramai uh, ki te art fair. Um, uh, ko rem kulublai toko ingoa um, ke um, kaitahu i te art space. Uh, my name is Remko. I'm the director of Art Space Aotearoa, and I'm sitting here um, in the framework of Ngatahi, which is a collective of, um, of uh, Tamaki Makaurau based um, uh, public art galleries. We have a stand also downstairs in which there are still 10 books for sale of uh, Judy Miller's amazing uh, project. Um, we organize ourselves uh, collectively, and uh, I'm doing the talk um, on behalf of that uh, group. So uh, I'm very excited about that. This is the second day that we organize these talks. Um, yesterday we had a, a very nice nice talk which was around internationalism. Um, and today uh, I'm very excited um, to see so many people here and talk uh, with these amazing uh, people and, and, and colleagues. So what we'll do is um, we're gonna keep it, it was a bit warm here yesterday and I think it's heating up already a bit, right? Um, so we're going to keep it to an hour, um, and uh, what I'm going to ask is for everybody to present themselves, to introduce themselves uh, for a very short uh, amount of time. You only need to take, sort of if you take three hours a person, that's going to be f more than enough. Uh, don't go to four hours. Um, I'll, I'll make a couple of more bad jokes uh, over the course of this hour. Um, so um, I think, uh, no seriously, we'll, we'll do very short. Uh, <laughs> short presentations of each other, um, um, of, of, of yourself, sorry. Uh, and then, um, uh, that wasn't a bad joke, that was just uh, uh, something wrong. Uh, and, um, and then what we'll do is I'll lead a bit of this discussion and what I would love to um, speak about, I mean, the, the title of the talks uh, that I've been uh, giving is a, a base of people. So for me, what was very much important is to organize these talks uh, and and um, speak with from um, embodied experience, lived experience that all of of us um, uh, have experienced and can 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 kind of put forward to the um, to the audience. Um, so it's not supposed to be a theoretical approach. It's really um, on on things that we see every day and things that we've been um, experiencing um, um, before, but also kind of how we perpetuate these thinkings and how we can speculate about the future. So today I really wanted to talk um, about um, how and how and when and really maybe looking back at how um, certain exhibitions or artistic um, endeavors uh, have been building up, especially in Aotearoa. So there can be exhibitions, historical exhibitions that I think we could or should learn more from. Um, and also, another element of the talk, I hope, would be how do we perpetuate and how can we think about Aotearoa-based art to contribute to, um, to, to, to the future, if at all. So two very simple questions. And then I thought it would be great to have, um, um, it's actually a bit split between um, very experienced people and, and the younger generation. Can I say it like that? <laughs> so. Um, so for me, it was really also important to really delve into um, in, 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 into those experiences, and then again to um, to look towards the future. So I'll I'll try and um, I'll do my best in mediating that. So um, maybe what we can start off with, and if I can ask you, Cameron, to um, start um, to introduce yourself. Um, thank you. Kia ora, Rem Kia ora, Remco. You can hear me. Um, Talofa Lava. My name is Cameron Alu Matamua. I fuck a papa to Samoa, China, and to England, and I am currently curator of St Paul Street Gallery AUT, and one of the newly appointed art critics for Art Forum International. Um, my name is Ashley Topaki. I'm uh, Samoan from Matautu Lefanga and Vailoa, and I'm Maori from Ngātiako down in Hauraki. I'm an emerging artist. And I also curate Window Gallery at the University of Auckland. Yeah. Nā Oh, Ah, kia ora mai tātou. Ko nā hiraka tōku ingoa. Nō ngai tūhui, te arawa me ngā tipango. Nō reira, 
no reira waku mohiotanga. Everything I know is about uh, is from where I come from. So I'm um, I call myself educated by um, waku iwi, my iwi, and I was schooled in um, many schools of learning, including university. Uh, in Arahuki. Um, so I'm uh, the former Indigenous Curator Māori Art at Auckland Art Gallery. <laughs> and um, uh, a position that I did hold for over 20 years. Um, but of course these things just don't magically appear. There's um, histories to those things. But more importantly, I don't live here anymore. So I live in Honolulu in Hawaii. I've been there for six years. And um, I'm an independent curator and a critic and a writer, I think I've found my real place um, by not being um, uh, attached to an institution. Um, it, was, um, it was a learning to, un to disattach myself from an institution. Um, but I love where I am. I absolutely thoroughly enjoy what I do. And I can't wait to see what's going on. Uh, kura koutou, uh, ko Nigel Barella ho, no tauranga moana o, uh, ko ngai te rangi, ngati rangi nui me te whakatoa hia oku iwi. Um, engari, uh, um, I live in Auckland and born and bred in South Auckland, but hail from tauranga moana. Um, <laughs> this is the first occasion where I've had the opportunity to say that I'm the former curator of Māori art <laughs> at the Auckland Art Gallery. And it's, it's, it's something to be sitting next to that whakapapa and that, that kōrero with Nahiraka here. So lovely to have you home too, Nahiraka, and with us. Um, and yeah, I, 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 as, as you were talking, Nahiraka, I'm reflecting on the doors and the, um, uh, the stage of my own thinking and career as a curator, writer, educator, artist, and how I view that. Um, recently doing a very large exhibition, Toy Tu Toy Ora, at the Auckland Art Gallery, and now being outside of that in the most beautiful way, um, but in, intimately connected to it, and um, pondering all those very ideas that you've just mentioned. So I am really looking forward to this talk, but also to um, my future as a thinker, curator, and... Um, yeah, it's, it's contribution to Māori development is, is the wider picture which I put it within. So, good to see you all. Kia ora. Ngā mihi ki Thank you so much for the introduction. Nigel, I was wondering if I can start with you. Maybe if you would look back sort of 15 years ago and you would think of either an exhibition or something that's related to it that made a very big impression on you. Um, is it? I was wondering... Could you could you walk us a bit through in something that um, uh, that inspired you in that sort of time? Yeah, um, there's a very obvious one for me, and one which really informs the exhibition Toy Two Toy Order, which I just recently um, presented, and that was uh, Pudang Yaho, um seen clearly, which Nahiraka uh, curated at the Auckland Art Gallery in 2001, and Taiafio Continuity and Change at Te Papa in 2002. Um, I was fortunate enough to be involved in both shows, but in different capacities, as an artist in one, and I suppose as a colleague in, and, a, and someone of the sector in the other. And for me, um, both shows were really powerful in the way in which they made visible a Māori framework um, and Māori visibility of our uh, contemporary Māori art story in and of its time at those moments in time in 2001 and 2002. And I was at that stage a, uh, a master's uh, student and really looking for my home in terms of where, does, where do I have to say and what I have to say and offer as a thinker. Where does it sit within this ever-evolving landscape? And those two exhibitions were, were quite anchoring moments. Um, for me as a thinker and as an artist. And um, Nahiraka's um, work in shaping a, um, 
a, a Māori, a Māori uh, strategic framework to pin, to underpin the exhibition, um, it, it, it was informative and it was uh, liberating. But it was also, it lit the spark to thinking, yeah, we can own our own stories in these spaces. And um, when I think about two, Toy 2, it's, it's doing the same thing, but it's maybe taking those next steps and, and being a bit more uh, bolder. Well, who knows? It's, 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 built on, it's predicated on the work of those two exhibitions and, and the, the tenacity to, to own space in, in ways that um, are ever-changing and evolving. So for me, those two exhibitions had a huge impact, yeah. Um, then maybe maybe it makes sense then to to go to you, Anga I mean that's that's sort of twenty that's over twenty years ago then I guess right yeah if we're looking look, yeah so how 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 was that for you then Anga was that was that um, we see now quite a lot of I think it's quite an exciting time now right so if we look at Toy Two Toy Ora um, the way that sort of identity politics are being played out it's very much um, for me is is very clear was that very Different than also in 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 this time, 20 years ago, or in that in that kind of era. How was how was that? How did that came about? Well, I just want to preface that by saying time is not real. Um, so um, I would I would say that my approach to th exhibition making is preceded by a pro my approach to how I think and what in influences my thinking. Um, so therefore, I grew up in Rātuki, if, if you don't know that already, and so um, that is a privilege to have had the life. I'm very privileged to have had that upbringing. And so my first um, engagement with how you can express an idea, really, and how you can talk about it, came from watching Weavers. So um, uh, my grandmother was an exceptional uh, weaver. Um, my mother was an amazing weaver. Um, and I'm a really very poor weaver. <laughs> my kete always went for picking the riwai and the kumara up or getting pippies. But I'm proud of that. So what I learned from that, why I'm sharing that story is because um, that doesn't happen in isolation. So it's related to um, your relationship to land, if you're picking kumara and riwai or if you're getting pipi. So it's, you have to have had a relationship with something, with the environment, with people. Um, and so I, I'm an accidental curator, by the way. Um, there was no such thing um, when I um, entered the field. And my mentors and heroes were my family. Um, they were the people I looked up to. And I am also fortunate enough to have, um, proximity-wise, um, uh, I was always amazed by the work of Hirini Mukomid, whom I later met, and um, uh, I would consider him to be a mentor. Um, so, you know, long story short, um, relationship has been everything for me. And I don't just mean that as a quick giveaway, you know, relationships is everything to everybody. I mean, I really did um, start from that position. And um, so the way uh, creativity was expressed in my upbringing um, was that it was a collaborative um, uh, endeavour but also everyone shared in the appreciation from the community. So it was not an individualized um, way of uh, um, uh, kind of trying to embody creativity. So it was either there or it wasn't, and if it wasn't, you tried hard to, be, to make it be there. And so uh, I think I've just really tried to practice that in my institutional um, curatorial practice life. Um, and maybe I've just been a bit lucky, um, uh, but my first exhibition, so you know, the, the kete weaving and uh, being around women um, was incredibly um, inspiring and important. So um, I have had the, 
the good fortune of having balance. So I have strong women in my life, strong leaders, men and women in my life. And um, so those were uh, people that I modelled after. Some might think they, I over-modelled in some areas. But um, uh, so by the time I stepped into the ring of curatorial practice, um, actually, it, it, we don't need to go into the whole story, but anyway, I, my um, claim to fame, and it used to disappoint, I think, the directors at Auckland Art Gallery, was that I was a security guard. Um, but it's the most significant thing to remind myself to be humble about the opportunities that came my way because I didn't follow a uh, traditional um, Pākehā trajectory into museums. And um, some of my Pākehā colleagues remind me of that. Like, who are you? How did you get in the door? Bro, I was a security guard. <laughs> so, so, you know, it's, it's that balance between life and purpose. And sometimes you don't know what your purpose is. You don't know what you're supposed to be doing. And so it's, um, you kind of realise at some point you have to figure it out. Mm. And so, um, you know, my first exhibition at Auckland Art Gallery um, was actually Te Ruera Mural by Colin McCann. There's some of you in the room that um, were there during that time. And my cousin stole the painting. Um, and so I was, I'd, I'd um, got a kind of, Increased in status from a security guard to a gallery guide, and some of my ex gallery guide colleagues are in the room. Choice job that one was, <laughs> and um, and so there was you know this thing happened at the security desk, and you know hush hush hush, hush director patron, and all this kind of media involvement. I wasn't a curator at that point. I was a gallery guide, and I was working in the library, I was helping curators and res with research, blah, blah, blah. And the director, you know, in a staff meeting said, well, what are we gonna do with this painting? And, um, and I thought, wow, they don't see me. They really don't see me, I'm a two-hole person. Um, and so, um, so the conversation went around and around, and so I just put my hand up, I said, excuse me, can I say something? And Chris, bless him, um, looked at me and said, what do you want to say? And I said, I want to curate that exhibition. That's, those people are my people. And that painting's about my people. I've got something to say. Um, and I, I just am saying that because it shows my, um, you know, I'm a good learner, I guess. <laughs> I learned from my people and what, what they, uh, how they, express themselves and I learnt to express myself in the same way. So yes, I've had opportunities on the way, but also I have had to create my opportunities by speaking from my world view um, and um, understanding after a while that our lenses are completely different. Um, but I needed to, to, um, to share what my lens was because if I didn't, uh, it was not going to be recognised. And so that's, that's been um, a practice, that's part of my curatorial practice, is um, being strongly opinionated. Uh, it doesn't matter that people listen, um, but it's important that I've expressed an idea. Right, Yamihi. So you have swipe access. <laughs> yeah. You gave up the swipe access at I some point, no? Inside context, okay. Um, talking about swipe access, I just wanted to go a bit to Elam and sort of going through um, this side and, and thinking through how it was when you both stu were studying um, Ashley and Cameron. Is it, would, you, would you have known about these examples? Because obviously you most, of, most likely have not seen, for example, these shows, um, the, older, the older ones, but is that something that you came in contact with, both of, of you? I mean, maybe you more as a, as a writer now, Cameron, but actually you're mostly active as an artist. Is that something that you were much aware of, or were you in similar ways um, um, aware of other examples that were significant for both of you? Um, well, it's great. It's such an honor to hear Nahidaka and Nigel speak about these projects and thinking about my university experience, it didn't necessarily come from Elam, but 
um, actually looking to St. Paul Street and uh, at AUT, where I work now. I've only worked there for a year, so I'm not being biased. Um, but thinking about a project that kind of taught me about this history was uh, si since 1984, and that was in 2015, I think, and uh, curated by Martin Awa Clark Langford uh, on invitation by Charlotte Huddleston, who's standing there, the great Charlotte Huddleston. Um, but that looked at the event of Te Māori, the, one of the first big exhibitions of Māori artifacts and art, um, but also looked at the kind of legislation of a bicultural nation. And one of the uh, outcomes of that project was a publication called Unfolding Kaitiakitanga, uh, led by Alessa Petaheta which also went into this great history of exhibitions such as Te Māori, uh, Pūrangi Aho, Choice at Art Space by George Hubbard, um, or Korurangi. So that was really my first introduction to this lineage of Māori contemporary art exhibitions and curating. Um, I guess for me, I was probably five in 2002, so I just started <laughs> primary and I know nothing about that kind of stuff. But um, yeah, uh, something that helped me along the way get really into that was the Tuakana program at Elam. I feel like if, if I didn't have that, I wouldn't be where I am. Because um, that kind of gave me way more confidence to look into Māori and Pacific art. Because um, usually when you're studying and you're trying to show off some, some like background thinking in that area, people are too scared to comment on it or they're just like, they, they keep quiet at, during your crits because they don't want to offend you or they don't, they don't have any like awareness of like those cultures. So yeah, that sort of kind of program is where I found, um, I don't know, where I found myself and where I found all my friends to be honest. And other than that, like an exhibition that stood out or just a work was um, that work that Shannon Tao did where he won the Walters Prize. And I think I was in my second year and I, I just heard the words and I walked in and I was like, this is so beautiful. And I got really emotional and that was the first time that I felt something towards the work. And that's, I think that that's when I had this shift in my thinking towards Maori art and what it means to be a Maori artist in like the contemporary art world. So, yeah. <laughs> Oh, that's great, yeah. But the, I mean, the Tuakana Taina um, project or the space actually is sort of an, 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 an organization or a space in a space, right? Because it's sort of completely different from, um, or supposed to be completely different from, from Elam, right? So, uh, and I think for both of you, maybe we, we spoke about it before, but I mean, especially that space, as you say, was very important, no? To, to many people. Is that kind of an, is that, sort of a new structure that you see emerging if we want to talk about organizations or institutions. Um, is that, uh, do you see uh, still a big need for that, for, for a space like that? I, I think that it also kind of organically happens. When I was at Elam, there was only maybe three other students in my year who were Māori or Pacific. Um, but so it was interesting to come back to do postgraduate studies two years ago, and to see the evolution of Tuakana. So I do think it's needed, but it also kind of organically happens without the institution's help to. Yeah. So a very organic way of growing, a, a need that grows in uh, within an institution, right? Yeah. If I, d if I then go, go back to, to this um, side, I feel like I'm ping-ponging a bit here. So. Um, it, it, yeah, right? Um, if you then, if this is then the organic uh, way of, of, of an institution within an institution, the Tuakana Taina uh, space, then it seems to me if you talk about it, Nahiraka, but also you, Nigel, in some of the interviews that I've read, it's more, it's kind of how do we, how do we keep in control of things, no? And, and I think every step of the way, it's, I think it's beautiful that when you say, um, kind of how you've learned uh, Ngahiraka, but I was wondering if you both, ca both can, can speculate a bit about this idea of, of, of having control within, within an organization or within an institution, right? Which is believed or imagined to be in itself already, it's very organized, it all, it's all smooth in there, but how do you as a sort of individual or as a curator 
uh, hold things in control? What, what do you hold in place and what not? Is it, does that make sense? Yeah, well, there's about 10 questions in there, Remco, to be <sighs> fair. Come on. But, um, <laughs> so, so I just want to, um, uh, uh, in re reply, um, uh, you know, so I, I do have um, opinions about uh, uh, university systems, or any systems, actually, um, uh, co-opting uh, cultural ideas such as tuakana in the university system. Um, uh, I think there's, there's um, it's, it's, n it's never intended to be um, uh, a practice beyond um, working for the system, working for the university. So they set up tuakana tēnā um, systems, um, students get jobs, other students get help, um, and this kind of thing. But it's a, it's, it's gone quite um, a distance from the original, um, not the original. Sorry, I won't go that far. But from the contextual meaning and understanding of those terms. So I get a little bit um, ho ha uh, hearing this. I absolutely recognise the good that it does at a superficial level because these people there and then they move on. And so you're reinventing that cultural construct in uh, an oppositional setting. Uh, it doesn't have to be oppositional, but um, it is. It's, it's the, the cultural context is not there to support the, co the continuity of that practice. So, uh, you know, uh, that's my hoha whinge on that one. Um, uh, so the other um, response really is, you know, I think as a Māori person, my institution is who I am. That, that's my lens. That's where I'm from is my institution. Yes, I have worked in other forms of institution, but that's not how I inhabit being in those institutions. And it's difficult for the people who are not from my institution. And so, you know, I end up being my own institution inside. And, um, you know, that... No, I'm deinstitutionalized. Thank you very much. <laughs> we'll have that conversation privately. But um, you, you know, it's it's being real in this business is not encouraged, mm. and so you know, um, it's hard to to uh, get a handle on issues that really are not my cultural institutional issues. Mm and um, trying to explain them to people is not my job. Um, and uh, you know, I'm, I'm not setting um, Nigel up in any way or form, Nigel, to, to talk about your situation. But um, you know, all I'm wanting to express and to help you out there because you are of some importance. Um, because we, you know, the work that curators do is done in isolation. And um, just to return to um, how I how I developed my curatorial practice is completely about relationship with people in place. Now, um, you know, in institutions who who uh, give us a salary, um, that's not the relationship. It's transactional in an institution. And as much as we make it relational to the best of one's ability, it's hard. It's frickin' hard. Um, and I can um, have empathy if um, one day we are going to have a National Māori Art Gallery, my chairman of um, a trust tells me, and I believe that, and we will have the opportunity to work with um, you, our co-collaborators, collaborators and partners um, and uh, so that we can share that understanding of working inside your own lens without having your lens second guessed or without having to write a policy paper about it or an exhibition uh, proposal that no one else has to do lower the way that you have to do. So you get my drift. You know, I, I don't want this to be that kind of conversation, but it is that kind of con conversation. And, um, you know, so I'm happy to be that 
person who um, can stand up for, I can stand up for myself, but that's not everybody. Um, and I'm also happy to be corrected, and that's also not everybody. So um, make good use of me. I'm just kidding. But, but you know, it's like, it's not a straightforward Remco, as you can, you, it must be not straightforward for you in your institution. Um, and we, we hold institutions to be um, uh, higher than they actually should be. And um, what is driving things um, sh maybe should be turned upside down, and it should be about people, especially in the current um, uh, COVID situation. And I know people don't want to talk, I know you don't want to talk about COVID, but I'll talk about it. Because it's real, you know, I don't think there's, the past is always the past, the future, well, forget about that. You know, it's the same as today. But no one's that interested about the present. And, and I think that's a bit of a problem. It's a bit of a problem if we cannot speak to our present and um, speak truth to that present. And um, so Nigel's gonna just <laughs> impress you. Go Nigel. Oh, good Lord. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I agree with, it's a, it's, a, it's a fraught landscape, you know, whether you're a student at Elam or whether you're a curator at the Auckland Art Gallery, you are, you're, you're, you're navigating the, the systems of power that allow you to um, be the independent, you know, be the, have, make sovereign choices about what you want to do and how you want to be, and to, to have the, to have the breathing space to figure that out. It's just not there. So it, it manifests in all sorts of uh, ways of trial and error and success or failure, whatever. But at the same time, um, it's not this. What none of what we've just discussed is new under the sun. Um, you know, Cameron and Ashley's experience at Elam. We're all Elam graduates here, and um, what's not new is that you've always had to seek out support as a Māori person or an Indigenous person to have your ideas supported in the institution. That's not new. And the, the tragedy for me is that that's still the trajectory. And I believe the framework's changed in 21 uh, at Elam. And I'm just using it as an example. But I, I think the irony is that my time there in 2001, 2002 was a huge learning curve, but it was also a really fraught one. And I see Carl Chittam was in my year. He's here too. Um, it's, it, it, it's tricky, but you do a lot of learning. But I think... Um, <laughs> You know, we're constantly bringing initiatives to, to the institution or to the power base for change. The institution's not going there, oh yeah, let's just do this differently because it's better for you. It's because we're pushing them to do it. And we forget that part. They're not, they're not, they're hard fought, hard won changes. And they've been pushed upon the institution or the dominant culture or the power base. So let's not pretend that it's, that's not a hard struggle and that, um, <laughs> and that it's, um, it, it has a, a context and a trajectory. So um, having said that, you know, we will take the wins and we should celebrate those things as they develop. And, um, you know, as a thinker, as, a, as, as Nahiraka said, you know, curating is just one part of who we see, how we see ourselves. It's an important form of authorship and agency and authority. And if you wield it in certain ways, there's amazing benefits that can come from that. And I'm really, I'm excited about that and that little light bulb moment for me at where I'm at at the moment. But it's also seizing that idea that I can, I'm in control of that conversation um, and that I'm going to wield it and shape it and collaborate with it the way that I see fit. And um, that, that's going to happen here first before it happens out there. And so if I can own that here, then I feel um, however it manifests out there uh, will be an iteration of that uh, ambition and that, that desire, yeah. Um, can I just jump in? Of course you can. So, you know, you know um, power is such a, a loaded word. So I'm, I'm not, um, uh, I don't advocate its, its use when um, it's not even well described in this country. And uh, so, let alone in institutions. So politically, you can see how that's just a complete mess um, in the health sector and um, 
and every other sector if you really want to look hard, right? Okay, so, you know, so in the museum sector, I think it's an unusual word to put in that setting. And um, so the most power is with yourself. So your personal power is the biggest power that team of five million, I'm starting to hate on that, uh, that uh, thinking, <laughs> that team of five million has personal power. You know what I mean? It's like, you know, and I just, um, you know, I'm six days out of 14 days quarantine, so I can talk like this, right? <laughs> you know, so just this idea that there is this thing called power um, uh, is quite a weird thing. Uh, and it's not just here in Aotearoa, though I notice it more because I'm here. Um, it's, it's actually a, um, a phenomenon that my parents certainly didn't have an issue with this word in the way that we do. Uh, my grandparents certainly didn't, and neither did, um, you know, the, the other generations that got us here in the first place. Um, and, you know, if I'm fair about Pagia, that's not even a problem back, you know, if, if, if you look at it without too much bias, um, that is not how humanity is built to kind of run to power. Uh, we've become used to running away from it, perhaps, but uh, forgetting that we have power, personal power. But I mean, within, within many organizations, there's a lot of, there, there is a lot of false power, no, Ngahiraka, uh, because I think a lot of the institutions that we've been working for, including uh, the one that I work for now, I mean, they could go tomorrow, s seriously. There's some of them have been built up so, uh, with so much, the structure, the financial structure or the organizational structure is, is, is built in such a way that it could fall, um, you need to throw so much money to, towards it, it could fall over pretty quickly, right? So if we would have had more modest um, organizations that you do not need to throw so much money towards, <laughs> then they become a bit more safer, right? But also, also maybe in the last two, two or three years, uh, Cameron and Ashley, maybe correct me if I'm wrong, there's been a lot of um, um, other kind of spaces and, and organizations that have been popping, popping up. Um, and I, I was wondering if you both can speak a bit about that um, to some of the ones that you know. Do you think that that is something that um, maybe goes against the, 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 um, the proclaimed power of, of bigger organizations? Is it, or does it offer an alternative to it? Um, I mean, Cameron, you're, you're connected to a couple of them, whether they be um, uh, writing platforms or more um, exhibition kind of spaces, but I was wondering if you can give a bit more insight on some of the uh, uh, examples that you've seen the last two years, and if that's something that um, sort of contests a bit the way that that Nigel uh, and Ngahiraka are speaking um, about that. Do these exist? Um, yeah, I we talked about this the other day, but. Um, my best friend and I, uh, Jasmine Tuya, we kind of started this little Auckland-based thing where it, it was called Cross Crits, and it stopped recently because COVID, well, we went into lockdown late last year again. Um, but it was pretty much just to fill this demand for um, cohesion among like uh, BIPOC creatives in Auckland. So um, like a lot of our friends we've met through like Cross Crits at uni and then that just stopped all of a sudden and me and Jasmine were like okay we need to like get this back up and running and um, get our community together pretty much and so we started off with like the help of Tao Tai um, to just get everyone together and meet each other and then get them comfortable enough to show their work and this wasn't um, like ex exclusively for visual artists we also had like dancers and jazz musicians and stuff like that in the space as well, which is really cool. Um, but me and Jasmine, we don't get paid, so it's not that transactional thing. It's more like we, we want to do this, so we want to make friendships, we want people to learn off of one another and also be in a space where they feel comfortable to look on their cultural experiences and feel comfortable sharing with other people. Um, and me and Jasmine are both really shy, so it's, it's not like a power dynamic where we're the lead of this whole thing. It's more like we, we facilitate it laterally, so we're just like 
Um, we just give space for people. We don't um, dictate or anything. So it's kind of a completely different way to what we're used to. And um, we also run the workshops too. <laughs> Everything for free. Everything's like we find food. We, we try not to go into our own pockets, but we, um, we rely on the generosity of other people. So <laughs> yeah, that's kind of how we run things. Um, yeah, speaking on that kind of lateral working, uh, I think, Remco, you're hinting towards Town Hall, this collective yeah, maybe, that I'm yep. part of. Yep. Um, we're a, a group of artists and curators and writers connected to New Zealand, but not necessarily living here. And I suppose we wanted to, we are really a working group, and so we meet every Tuesday uh, informally, either for a hot question or to talk about a project that we might be working on. Um, but it's about working slow, I think, because a lot of us are attached to institutions where there are certain outcomes that you have to reach at a certain time with certain KPIs or whatever. So I suppose it's also about having fun, too. I mean, artist run spaces and initiatives aren't new, right? Like, they've always existed in this way, um, and they always sort of come out of a uh, maybe a scepticism towards the rigid aspects of our more formal institutions. Um, yeah, but I suppose one example is the Open Hall Initiative that we have, which is run generally every month. Uh, we've had four now, and there was a big issue that happened last year within the Auckland art community, and there was some kind of maybe resistance or uh, hesitation from our larger institutions to speak to that publicly. So, yeah, we opened up a public space uh, to discuss that, yeah. I suppose. That's, that's quite a nice way that you, in, 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 talking about speaking publicly and um, maybe speaking publicly also from the, the stage that maybe an organization um, or an institution can give. H how was that for you, Ngahiraka, when you went to um, a place like Honolulu? Uh, how what were the differences that you noticed uh, between a place like Aotearoa and then going into Hawaii? Um, w were there very much differences if you think about like how to how to think about critique, people speaking publicly, which of course in an American context is very differently. Um, do you notice a lot of difference then and now um, in, in, in being able to speak about things? in general, or, or offering a critique? I mean, I, I know that you want to kind of speak things out, but is, it, um, is that a, a, a technique and a tactic that you learned more of in, 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 in the US? Um, or as I should say Hawaii, actually. Um, and, and how do you imagine that to be here now in Aotearoa, a place where, where, where you come back and return to? Stand, that's 11 questions. <laughs> this is good. Yeah. <laughs> So, um, in the Hawaii context, um, it's warmer. <laughs> Let's start there. Yeah. And um, the, the, I'm married to a Hawaiian wife, just to be clear about that. And um, so, the relationship that I have as an individual person with my background and my whakapapa is one of being in relationship. And so this is me in my public life, you're seeing it. This is me in my private life, um, uh, except I don't have this many people around. But I think you do have to find a, a, a good place where you can uh, express and communicate ideas um, and public speaking is just the last part of it it's not everything so it takes time to build um, uh, relationships to even get to the point where you're invited to speak rather than crashing to speak um, and uh, so I had a lot of uh, uh, experience um, because I have a long term over time, I've been going back and forth, so I have had the, the um, 
uh, I've been able to uh, make my way perhaps more easier than others would. But it's a very um, receptive culture. Can't say the same about home, but it's a very receptive, meaning people are open to relationship building. There's no uh, confusion around me being a Māori person um, in Hawaii. I'm not, um, I'm not trying to be Hawaiian, and um, I certainly would not speak um, with any authority on things Hawaiian, but I can contribute, contribute uh, from my perspective as a Māori person with relationality to a people and a place. So um, I've been very fortunate to be able to have made, um, you know, uh, decent enough inroads to earn a living there um, in this in my role as an independent curator and critic and historian, blah blah. Um, but it's I'm still the Manuhiri. I am not from there. I do not speak on behalf of people, which is something that I don't think we quite um, have gotten right with our Pacific people here. Um, meaning, Pacific people are manuhiri. You can call yourself whatever you want to, including mana, moana, go ahead. But this is still Aotearoa. And um, so I will speak on authority um, on this issue because I'm the manuhiri uh, in a tuakana space. So Hawaiians are tuakana to Māori, but I'm, I'm a minion. I, I've got no place except I do value my relations with those people. I do not overstep them, and I do not pretend somehow being married to a Hawaiian gives me that patina. No, it does not. So, um, you know, I think, I think that's a basic... Um, learning that could be uh, helpful for stronger relationships in Aotearoa. And, you know, I'm always about the, you know, the glass half, glass half full. So, um, you know, I, I want these things to move forward because it's good for everybody. Um, what's good for Māori is good for everyone. You're going to get that one day um, if you've not already reached that understanding. And what's good for you is good for us, but you've got to talk about it. So, you know, we're, we're, um, there, there's no soft discussion. That doesn't really work. It works for openings. <laughs> but it doesn't really work in real person, you know, in, in your real life. And so, Remco, you know, there's, you can't blindly be in spaces, um, you know, blindly saying stuff. Um, and because there's consequences to everything. And um, you've got to own your part of that stuff. Uh, you know, it doesn't magically disappear with Janola or whatever other form of, you know, other forms. But, um, uh, you know, so I, I think there's not a very clear... Um, uh, and perhaps Māori should be clearer. Um, completely own that. We are not, perhaps, uh, as... Um, coming to ideas with enough clarity uh, around how we want to relate. But in, in the Aotearoa space now, it's, you know, it's, I've been away for six years, but I haven't been home for three. But it feels like 30 years has passed. And, um, you know, there's, there's a lot that is even more um, hidden, um, which I, I think is a, you know, is a, it's an uncomfortable place for me. Uh, because there doesn't appear to be uh, a lot of um, ability for, for truthful discussion. So I'm, I'm wondering what that discussion was about the town hall, you know, because I wasn't here, whatever it was that happened. Yep. Um, you know, so there, there's an assumption that there's an obliqueness to how we might get what happened there, and, and I didn't get it. Um, you know, so maybe we could just be a little bit more clearer. But, but, uh, I mean, on that clarity, then is that, is that something that you always need to explain to others? Is that, is that clarity? No, it's hard, it's hard work. Okay. Put the hard yards on, do the hard work. But clarity, does that not always talk about um, you need to relate to the other person? And then you, you, have it clear, you have your ID clear for yourself, 
but you need to relate it back to the other person. So you need to be clear, you know? Whereas your, your ID can be overly clear for yourself. Yeah, we're, we're going to be friends for life. Oh yeah, okay, cool. Cool, 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 cool. <laughs> but you Sorry. know what I mean? It's like, you know, you can't make it too hard. Don't make it too hard. Don't overthink it. You know, oh, I like the, overthinking. The, we're a human being. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're a human being. I think, though, the learning is, is not one way. You know, the learning and the, the challenge is in two directions, and it's not all... The heavy lifting is in both directions. So, you know, that's... that's I, I, I feel like we make excuses for the heavy lifting not happening on the other side way too much. And, um, uh, you know, if it's, if it's about partnership and dual dialogue, then it's about making the partner accountable for the heavy lifting they need to do as well, um, if we're going to talk metaphorically about it. Um, yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, what I would love to do, actually, is that we have uh, sort of 10, 15 minutes, uh, because it's getting hot, and I really um, would give it really uh, to the audience to ask some questions, because I know there will be some burning questions. So this is your time to think about it. Uh, don't let this kind of awkward silence come uh, now that I give the microphone to somebody. So please, if there's a question um, to anybody here, um, then now, now is a good time. So, okay, there's the awkward silence is coming now, and then somebody's gonna, gonna step up, right? Come on, Andrew Hirani. <laughs> oh no, do I need to ask? Then I need to ask another question, right? Really? Nobody? Come on, there's this amazing knowledge sitting here. <laughs> Kia ora, thank you very much. Kia ora former comrades and colleagues. <coughs> My question, I was very interested to hear you talk, Nahiraka, about the lack of clarity uh, that you observe in the country around discourse and the arts and culture, this lack of clarity. Do you, do you see that, am I correct that you said that that's getting stronger, that lack of clarity compared with the past, say 20 years ago, you say it feels like you've been away for 30 years, but are you noticing that things are becoming somehow murkier or more hidden? Can you reflect on why you think that might, might be, or an example of where you're seeing that? Um, so, things I'm, I know this is the art fair, it's not the public domain as such, but I've also kept up with um, uh, what people are, uh, are writing and thinking and saying in the space, in the museum space. And there's, there's not a strong team of five million. There's not a strong sense of who people are and what, they, what, what people are wanting to say. So it's kind of folded into economy, into policy, into um, you know who's entitled to be speaking, um, and you know, goodness, don't even have a you know don't even try and form a political conversation. So that happened in my grandparents' time, and um, so there's 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 a very strong disabling of, um, of um, ability to speak, even in, from an institution perspective, former colleague. Nothing's changed, right? You don't have to say anything. Don't even nod. But you know what I mean? It's, it's like the status quo is the strongest element in the culture. And... Um, uh, and there's such a, a questioning of your own thinking, of your own thought, of your own ability to, to um, assist. Okay, here's my example. Coming through quarantine, young, handsome Polynesians sitting on the trolley. We don't know where the bags are going to get picked up. Walking, grab a trolley, pushing the trolley, get to the other end and says, 
you don't need that trolley. I said, bro, you could have told me that, you know, 200 y yards up the road. And so get through the stages and everyone is confused. I know these people are working hard and they're really, it's, it's strange. But there's no ability to say anything. Um, there's, n there's no ability for people to correct each other in the process. Even for me to say something, excuse me, like la la la, nothing, nothing. Nobody even said, kia ora, welcome home. And I'm wondering, what country am I in? Like, what is wrong with this picture? Um, and so even at a border exper level experience, I've actually, that's been, a, um, you know, a, um, that experience at the border has been reflected in every experience if, if I just go and buy a bottle of wine or I go to the grocery store or have a conversation. People are very reticent to engage. And that wasn't, that wasn't the community I left. And I know a lot of, a lot of sh crap has happened, but where's our personal power? Where's, where's your personal power? Um, where's your ability to say, wow, I hope you have a great day. There's, you know, those, you know, those little slogans that say, uh, be kind. I haven't had a lot of kindness shown to me since I've been home. Gosh, where's the be kind except from Tetuhi Art Gallery and Hirani and her wonderful staff. And you all must go and see the exhibition, which opens tomorrow. I'm just shameless here right now. But you know what I mean? Where th that whole um, you know, uh, identity that New Zealand prides itself on, shame on you, not you, but you know what I mean? Wow, you gave it away that quickly? And, um, you know, goodness knows what everyone else is, and the only, uh, is thinking because the only people returning are New Zealanders. They're having the exact same experience as I did. And I'm going to give you, it's not all doom and gloom, but I'll give you this one. It's a drug phrase. And the phrase is this. Uh, it's called non-specific amplification. We're in this state together of non-specific amplification. It's where we are so overwhelmed, we don't know what the hell is going on. We're hoping we're making sense, we're hoping we're at least relating, but this other thing is completely taken over. Non-specific amplification, guys. Think about it. There's a question there. Kia ora koutou. Um, thanks for that. I, th I think I now have to think about that. Um, my question goes back a little bit further into your kōrero, and thank you all for sharing um, some of your kaupapa because I have learned a lot, and I think we all have a lot to learn. My question relates to the institutional, um, I guess, uplift that we need, and I wonder if you think there is some scope for there being pressure from above either through legislation or through some kind of structural change that requires um, a much clearer embracing of uh, the principles of te or te waitangi and of our bicultural and then multicultural, uh, yeah, our, our ambitions and how that might work um, within the institutions that you know of. Yeah, for sure. I think you need to start by um, reinstating them because they've all been removed. And, you know, um, if you don't directly <sighs> deliver to those principles and aspirations, then why aren't we? And let's start with that question. Let's apply that question to all our uh, regional institutions at the moment and see how they, if they're fit for purpose. And um, let's also, you know, we're all accountable within institutions for what we do and how we do it. And that goes for the directors of institutions. And how do, we, how do we account for that accountability? How can we be assured of that? And you can all read in between the lines of what I'm saying. I'm sure you'll connect the dots. But at the same time, that's what's lacking at the moment. And what's lacking is the ability to speak freely about that and to expect it. And um, that would be my concern around that at the moment is that if you systematically over the last 10 years remove them as things that you have to be accountable to, you know, here we are at this point. Maybe we should all demand that they're reinstated. 
But but is that not a more? That you, I mean, you were talking about power a lot, of course. Is that not? Should there not be a bit more fearlessness of power then, right? So that there's no that we can get that all. Yeah, but you're done. a director. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, let's okay. be honest about how power is understood. Yeah. And how it is shared or not in institutions. So as a director, the buck stops with you about how you wanna how you want that to play out in your institution. But it's I mean not or not all directors are the same. I mean I've had a wonderful experience with a with I a director. Agree. <laughs> with a director, thank you very much. But uh, but I also want to kind of not go down that miserable road because um, uh, everyone needs to own responsibility. And um, and I think the wonderful thing about COVID. COVID. Yeah, yeah, do you do it? You do it. <laughs> the wonderful thing about COVID is that um, things will naturally rise to the surface that have always been there. And so, um, race, institutional racism, systemic um, problems in every nook and cranny of the country, they will make themselves visible. And um, and I think that drives. Um, attention, uh, and I'm, I love tension. It's an amazing um, thrill, uh, but it's also something that's necessary to, necessary to um, get us into change. So I see uh, things that occur that we're not happy about just to be um, a, a kind of open pathway to walk toward change rather than resisting change. And, um, you know, this is easily, more easily said than practiced. And, uh, you know, I'm the person who will run to the barking dog because there's, you know, the dog, if you run the other way, the dog's going to get you. Uh, but, you know what I mean, we have to be courageous in our own power rather than focus on, you know, the misery um, line because you, you can't. I mean... Pessimism and negativism is not helpful to get us into a different mindset, and it's actually hard work. Um, but you know, thankfully, team of five million is overall optimists. <laughs> At least one of them is. Kia ora. You talked about courageousness, and um, it's something I'm not usually able to do, which is to ask questions, but. I work in an institution which is the primary education system. Um, so I, I would love to have a piece of positive advice which you, you could give to me so that we can impart that to a, a, on the grassroots level with our students. Um, whether that's a positive experience you've had that was memorable or whether it's just a piece of advice you'd like to give someone who works with students, with young children. Ab absolutely. Smile at them a lot. Tell them you love them and tell them that they are important to be on the planet right now. You know, it is that simple. Uh, it's, it's how I work with artists. And I think, you know, artists never grow up. They're all, always children. <laughs> and, um, and, and so, you know, these, these, are, these are the basics. These are the ABCs of, um, you know, building a healthy, optimistic society. Thanks for doing the work you do. Kia ora tatu. Uh, I'm Brian from Art Explore and we, we run an art appreciation organisation that um, takes groups around and, well, tries to get them beside art, uh, both here in Auckland and also in Wellington. And we've been at it quite some time and we've, for even longer, we've been sort of associated with art, collecting art. And, and I'd just like to take another path through this conversation we're having, which is getting back to the reality of, uh, for you, Nigel, especially, uh, toy to toy ora and its gestation, because it seems like a huge time coming, like, you know, a huge period. And also, uh, I'd like to observe that it's the first time in my experience, that the Auckland Art Gallery has been taken over by contemporary art. And I think that's, that's part of that the whole um, ball, string, of, you know, string puzzle of the whole thing where there's so many different 
uh, directions that the AAG has maybe pointed itself in that it's, it becomes very confusing to actually put contemporary art, let alone Māori art, in that context. So I just wanted you to just give a few words about that. Um, did, was there a question in there? I just don't know where to go with that. <laughs> the, the path, of, the gestation of that particular exhibition, that, that's the question. Yeah. Um, Oh, look, I think um, in a nutshell, the exhibition was born out of a desire uh, and, a, and a need on my part and uh, a hunch on my part to, to uh, reinvest in um, the idea of a survey show of seeing contemporary Māori art uh, in its totality or seeing us together. I mean, if you think about Pūrangi Aho in 2001, 20 years is a really long time. And I'm not saying, and one of the questions around the show is, is a survey of contemporary Māori art still relevant? Is that still needed? And I think, you know, we're on the way to answering that through the, our own experiences of it and the discussions we've been having since it's been open. But it was really the desire to, um, to own this space and to, and to see contemporary Māori art um, uh, on, on a level that we haven't seen it for a really long time. And um, I feel... You know, as, a, as an emerging artist 20 years ago, when those other two shows were uh, presented, I got the benefits of being one of those artists and, and um, in the mix of that, that momentum and movement. And it was extremely powerful and empowering in helping me see myself and understand my place and what I could contribute. And I often feel really... Um, embarrassed and guilty for the, 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 the generations underneath me that haven't had that opportunity to, to, um, to own the space uh, here and literally and for, a, for a, a, a window of time to think through what they want that to be moving forward. Um, and so for me that was one of the, the big drivers. But it was also to, 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 to say to the the framing of the Western art canon that actually here's a different way we can think about our place and being as New Zealanders. And um, yeah, that was my main goal. If I can say, I haven't seen the show. So, um, but <laughs> if, if Nigel knows I haven't seen the show. Um, but if I can say that um, Often, the um, way these types of large survey exhibitions are re received um, by the public, they're, they're received differently by many publics. Joe Blog is one public, the arts um, community is another public, um, our international colleagues um, and, and um, national institutions, so it's a, a different public. So we, there are many, many publics for these kinds of um, exhibitions. And what they say, we can say this is true of all exhibitions, large um, exhibitions that happen, is there's a need. It's meeting a need in, in the community or indeed in the country. So that's good, that's thumbs up to contemporary art. It doesn't matter if it's Māori, but it does or if it's Aboriginal, or if it's you know, Indian, or, or whatever. There's a need. People are still interested, and those needs should be met. Um, so I just want to kind of circle back to relationships, because things don't happen in isolation. Things don't get popped up as um, Nigel's 111 artist. Yep. By the way, this is not a joke, but I, I think about it, Nigel. Isn't that the emergency number for, for Aotearoa? <laughs> Dial 111? Yeah. Yeah? Okay. So there's a, there's a hidden message. Um, uh, so, you know what I mean? It's like... You're so Hawaiian a, right now, by the way. <laughs> thank you. I, I resemble that. Um, you know, so we have to stop thinking so narrowly, sir, is what I want to say, about uh, things that come up in our communities and in our societies and whether it's discourse is just a hard on fight. There's a reason why that needs to happen. And, um, you know, we should be all on um, our best form in communicating with each other about why things are important or why they've arrived when they've arrived. 
but to don't look back to them as if they were some apparition. We should be enjoying this type of engagement all the time, not every 20 years. Um, and um, it should be that embedded, and we should embody that. So we should be engaged. And I, and I guess this is what I'm feeling, what I'm seeing at home here, is there's still um, you know, a stand back and observe everything rather than a jump in and be involved in engaged mentality. Um, and everyone's afraid to ask questions or to express their thoughts. So, you know, it's up to you. It's no, no one else is making it hard for you. You know, just jump up louder if you think 20 years is too long. Um. Uh, kia ora, korongo mai tuku ingoa. Te ka nga ki te mahi ki a koutou um, ngā kai kōrero te rā nei. Um, I'd just like to talk about or ask a question about relationships. And I think relationality is the foundation of being Māori or most indigenous cultures um, and even if it's a negative relationship we are still in a state of being in relationship with someone and putting power into that. I would just um, maybe ask for some advice or just um, some whakaro around engaging in negative relationships but bringing that back to a space where we can um, tiaki to tato oranga, to tato wairua, kia noho mauri tau, i roto i era um, momo um, engagements and yeah, I'm sure that's something that you've all experienced in, in our field and just some thoughts around that or some something happy <laughs> to think about negative relationships or rela being in relationship with someone and maybe even it's being in relationship with someone who doesn't want to be in relationship with you and how that might look. We have one of these oblique conversations. Uh, you know, um, there's a lot of psychology in what you were saying. I can't go there. <laughs> but, you, you, you know, you, um, gosh, you're young, darling. Just run. <laughs> run. Go for it. God. Yeah. Only. I, I think sometimes the... Um, you know, we know the answers to those questions sometimes. It's a challenge of trying to navigate the sticky space you find you're in. And sometimes you, a little bit like Nahiraka just said, is you've got to, you've got to be recentered back with what you, where you're at and what you find where your compass is and let that really tell you, where, where you what, what you're willing to do and what you're not. And um, look at my resignation as an example. You know what I mean? That was, that was an empowered decision. That wasn't a decision I made at the moment of doing a very large project, but it was based on that very idea of, of I'm not gonna talk to myself, I'm gonna actually make an empowered decision. Yeah. Running towards the dog, no? Hell yeah. That's it. Hey, I, I do want to have a last moment to hear from both of you. Um, I just wanna, ask you sort of what is what is the exciting thing happening now in Aotearoa if if you think about things that are bubbling up why are you both still active here in Aotearoa or in Tamaki because I would know I both know this is of course a bit of a provocation but I mean I've, I've talked also many times with you Cameron about it um, there is a specific choice of why you're why you're here and why things are exciting uh, to happen I was wondering if you can give a both of you can give a bit of a last remark, uh, given that we're talking about relationships, running towards the dog, um, and talking about how and when, then I think it's really nice to hear a bit from you what you both think is, is, is exciting um, to happen um, now. Oh, oh yeah. Um, yeah, I'm still here because um, oh, I'm actually trying to solve a problem from both ends. So I'm trying to, I, I have a lot of passion for my people and 
Um, so I do my art and I do all this stuff on the side from like a Māori perspective. But I'm also working in policy, so in that way I'm hitting it from two sides, which I, which is really busy for me. <laughs> but I'm, I just want to be in those spaces, and I'm talented in this. I can write and I can do policy, and somehow I'm in it, even though I did fine arts and they took me in. <laughs> so I'm just like, that. That's why I'm still doing both at the same time, is because I feel like I have to. It's like an obligation to. Um, I don't know, to rectify these inequities that are present in both worlds. And um, the thing I'm most excited about in terms of relationships is just like the relationships I formed in uni. So I have a group of about seven of us and we're like killing it. We're, and that's because we stuck around and we were real tight throughout our five or four years at uni. And like, I feel like all of us are in the art fair at the moment. Like we're all here and we're all, um, emerging and becoming more and more prominent and that's because we were so close and we had that that tight-knit group yeah I have a really simple answer I suppose um, I love art I love people that make art and our people will always make art so I suppose that's what sustains me yeah. but nothing specific of the time now here I'm going Come blank on. you're going <laughs> blank you're going blank okay Run, run towards the dog. That's that stays with me. I'm gonna, because I always thought that you need to stand still. Because if a dog comes to you, you stand still. I get the hell away from the dog myself. <laughs> I'm scared the dog's gonna okay. bite me every time. No day. Try. It. try it. I will, I'm gonna try it. Yeah, I'm gonna try it. No day though. Um, ngamihi ki akoto, ngamihi ki akoto i tene um korero i tene ra. Um, thank you so much uh, for joining us. I really want to thank all of the speakers, Cameron, Ashley, Nahiraka, and Nigel. Um, and uh, thank you so much for, for coming. I, uh, I learned a lot and I hope you did as well. Um, speak out, run towards the dog, relationships, um, give up your job. Um, <laughs> those kind of things, yeah, thank you.